Hi, and welcome to the Facts and Blog and Podcast. Hi, and welcome to episode 49 of the Facts and Blog and Podcast. We have a great show coming up for you today. It's a special episode. We're trying to put in place just all one singular place all of the best information that we've put together over the course of the last couple of years on everything about our barrels. So we're going to be talking about quality inspection. We're going to be talking about uh, the Barrels 101 episode where we went through all of the different profiles and fluting and so on. Talking the difference between duty and match series. Talking about steel types, coatings, extensions, uh, and so much more, including information on our integral barrels as well as our our pinned gas block barrels. So hopefully this gives you the one-stop shop for everything you need to know about facts and barrels and to help uh, inform your next barrel purchase or shopping event. Before we go any farther, I do want to let you know that today uh, we have a special giveaway brought to you by our friends at Lockdown and Crimson Trace. For this episode, we are giving away a Crimson Trace CWL 300 tactical flashlight, as well as a Lockdown Puck uh, smart security device. Uh, so make sure you enter to win for these. You can go to factsandfirearms.com slash blog and click on episode 49 for all of the daily entries. So make sure you get those in each day and uh, this giveaway will run through Wednesday of next week. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at the Facts and Barrel Supercut episode. These are Facts and Firearms barrels. Quality is embedded in our barrel DNA from the very beginning. Unlike many barrel manufacturers, Facts and Barrels are not merely milled from blanks, but are manufactured right here in our Cincinnati, Ohio facility. Let's start with the Duty Series. Crafted from 4150 CMV steel, Fax and Duty Series barrels are durable, reliable, and hit the market at a competitive price point. The Duty Series sports an 11 degree target crown and is available in a variety of calibers and profiles. Next is the Match Series. Fax and Match Series barrels are made from 416R stainless steel. They include enhanced 5R rifling and 11 degree recessed target crown and a nickel Teflon coated barrel extension. Fax and pinned gas block barrels take the quality and accuracy of our barrels and include the added security of a pinned gas block. Selected from our most popular barrel models, we take the biggest headache out of pinning your gas block by pre-notching the gas block journal right here in our Cincinnati facility. Each pinned gas block barrel comes with the pin as well as a pre-drilled low-profile gas block. Faxon Integral Rifle Barrels are the perfect choice for any shooter who is looking for the maneuverability of a shorter barrel while maintaining the ATF 16-inch minimum length requirement. There is no need to find a capable gunsmith to pin and weld a muzzle device. The integrated muzzle devices maintain clearance for both gas blocks and barrel nuts. All facts and barrels are fully stress relieved, air gauge tested, magnetic particle inspected, and individually checked for headspace by precision custom hardened gauges. These are facts and barrels, backed by Faxon's lifetime guarantee. And this is Facts and Firearms. We'll be right back with more of the Facts and Blogging podcast right after this. Hi, and welcome to the Facts and Blogging podcast. Since 1994, Crimson Trace has defined and built the laser sighting category through design, innovation, and performance. With an obsession to create best in class electro optics, Crimson Trace is proud to further enhance the experiences of shooters, hunters, and rugged outdoor enthusiasts. Learn more at crimsontrace.com here to elevate confidence in moments that matter. All right, so let's hop right into it. Things to consider when you are picking a barrel. Um, you know, Pat, let's start with you. When, when you're barrel shopping for yourself or maybe you have a friend or a family member asking you, okay, where do I even start? You know, what are some of the things that you tell them to consider? First and foremost, um, you got to kind of define your role. You, you need to determine before you start buying parts, what is this rifle going to be doing or pistol or, you know, any other firearm for that matter. So that's, that's the most important thing. Um, there are some caveats with local and federal laws. So if you want to build a rifle federally, 
you have to have a 16 inch minimum overall length for your barrel. Now that can be in the form of a 14.5 that's been pinned and welded, or alternatively, you could go with something like our integral muzzle device barrels where the muzzle device is machined into the barrel, but it still meets that overall length of 16 inches. So once you've kind of got that piece out of the way, you, you have to determine what purpose is this going to serve. And, and it may not necessarily be just one role. So you may have an AR that you want to build that you want to use for home defense, but you're also going to be doing some general just plinking or target shooting or even maybe some competition with. So a lot of the different roles for these, um, or a lot of the different roles can be filled by the same gun, but you do want to kind of lay those out before you start purchasing parts because your role is going to dictate how you build out the whole system um, once you move, you know, from buying just the barrel. And Mark, how about you? I mean, do you, when you get this question, are, are people generally asking you profile questions? Are they generally asking you like length questions? Like when, when people are shopping for barrels and they're asking your advice, kind of what's the first thing they, they jump up to with you? It, it, I, I agree with what Pat says. I mean, you have to determine the purpose of the rifle. Um, you know, Personally, I like having specific builds for specific things, and depending on if you're starting out and need something that does a lot of different things well, or or something specific like punch and paper, for example, or if you want to do a, a course where you're going fast and lighter weight helps. Um, so I try to narrow down with folks what is the purpose, and I agree with Pat on that. That's probably the key thing. But let's go ahead and talk about some profiles of barrels um and the you know the first kind of granddaddy of them all uh you know would be that government socom uh style um you know mark where would people have first kind of seen this profile and you know how long has it been or maybe was it you know one of the primary uh you know primary barrel profiles you would first see this profile back in the 80s when they went to the a2 and they heavied up the barrel a bit, you know, in the front and so on. So that would have been its origin. And then the M4 is kind of a type of government SOCOM with the cut for the M203. Um, but that's, that's kind of where they got started. And it's, I guess it's one of our more popular profiles. Yeah. And Pat, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that even after all the, you know, leaps in barrel manufacturing, you know, not just us, but, you know, a lot of you know, modern manufacturers included, even with all these things that, that we could do now, you know, why do these kind of larger, heavier, you know, bigger profile bar barrels, why are they still, you know, a, a leading seller, even for people like us? A big part of it is it's, it's kind of a tried and true profile. It, like Mark said, it's been around for a, a long time. Um, people are used to seeing it. People know it. As far as profiles goes, it's not a bad profile. Um, it's a good medium weight, you know, just kind of general use profile um, that serves its purpose. It's, it may not be the most ideal for every situation. You know, like we talked about before, situation dictates what you're using. You know, it, it may not be, it may not be heavy enough for a long range target shooter and it may be way too heavy for the guy doing the ultralight build. Um, so it, it falls kind of right in the middle of the spectrum. And, and I think that's, that's what people go for a lot of times is they want a little bit of both worlds. So yeah. they, they think that fits the role. Let's go ahead and move to our pencil uh, okay. profile. Now the, the big thing with this, and I think we should probably address it up front is the historical reputation of pencils. So I'm not saying our pencil barrel, um, you know, since we've been around since 2012, but we're talking historical, I don't know, what, what would you say, Mark, 60s, 70s, 80s, when people were first trying to make pencil barrels and they were just kind of like straw tubes, you know, it just, it, it, you, they couldn't do the same type of manufacturing stuff that we do. I mean, the original AR-15 was pencil. So that was kind of the idea, lighter weight, easier on the soldier and so forth. Um, I think the heat relieving has improved quite a bit since then. And that's what differentiates the barrels from then till now. Um, you know, with the proper heat stress relief, 
Uh, groups are going to open up when the barrel's hot, and that's going to happen. But generally, the point, the center of the average of the group doesn't move. So it gets larger or smaller depending upon how hot or cool it is. Uh, so from that viewpoint, the technology on the stretch relief has really helped these things perform better. For sure. And yeah. You know, something you mentioned too was, you know, that, uh, you know, our barrels, our pencil profile barrels are what's going into the, uh, what would stoner do rifle from, you know, in range and Brownells. And, um, you know, so we've gotten a reputation with it, but you know, kind of what are your insights on, on the, on the pencil profile, both, you know, yesterday, yesterday far and today. <laughs> yeah. On the, uh, the historical side of things, uh, the real limitation has been the stress relieving, um, especially in, back in the cold SP1 days. They just did not have the technology and the science um, available you know, that we have available to us now. So if you look at the What Would Stoner Do project, which InRange TV did a whole series of videos on that are great to watch if you go check them out on YouTube. Um, they did a specific video comparing our pencil barrel to a Colt SP-1, and they basically shot a, shot a five-round group, dumped an entire magazine as quickly as possible, and then laid back down and shot another five-shot group. And what they're trying to show is that the center of the group still stays the same with a properly stress-relieved modern pencil barrel, whereas with the Colt SP-1 barrel, the groups were kind of all over the place. Like you couldn't, you couldn't pick a center point of the group because it was flinging rounds, you know, high right, low left, way off the target, you know, so it was kind of all over the place. Whereas with the modern pencil barrels, the groups will open up, like Mark said, you know, they will get larger in size, but your point of aim and point of impact is not going to shift. Now, something that you mentioned there is obviously heat and how they, you know, as the barrel heats up, regardless of profile is going to impact your, your grouping. You know, whether, whether that's a, you know, five shots or 10 shots or however many, as long as that barrel keeps heating up, you're probably going to see that expand a bit. Um, and Mark, when you and I were talking earlier, you know, I keep thinking of heat dispersion and heat distribution. And, and I think you put it in better terming with heat saturation, you know, yes, the pencil barrels heat up quicker, but they also cool down quicker. Could you just say, you know, maybe share some of the, the perks of that, or maybe the shortfalls of that, or, or, you know, what you think maybe people don't think of when they're thinking about heat and pencil barrels. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a reason why paper punching guys use heavy barrels, you know, they can shoot them hot and they, they, keep their groups better longer. Uh, these barrels, there's not as much material there, so it does heat up quicker, and you're gonna see that group open up, but with the point of impact not changing, the average, the middle not changing, um, you know, if you're ringing steel at a couple hundred yards, it's really not gonna affect you that much. Um, the other thing is they do cool off quick, and as they cool off, the group will shrink back down. Got it. Well, let's take it and put it in the best of both worlds, uh, looking at something that is, you know, really a, a, a kind of a facts and staple, if you will, is our own uh, profile, the gunner profile. People love it because it it is kind of the best of both worlds between the lightweight benefits of a pencil and the benefits of a more you know midweight uh, government SOCOM profile. So the big thing it does is it removes the weight that the SOCOM has out front of the gas journal. It removes that completely and goes to a pencil profile. So you have the, the ability to maneuver a little bit quicker. You can, if you're doing competition or just shooting for fun and you're transitioning between targets, it allows you to swing the front end of that gun quicker it retains the weight in the rear, so you still have some of the benefits of the the slightly heavier profile back closer towards the shooter, um, which gives it a lot more balance. You're not dealing with heavier weight out at the very end where it's furthest from your body. It brings the it keeps all the weight of the barrel closer to the shooter. Um, so even though there's not a significant difference in weight between the the SOCOM and the gunner, it, it has a much better feel to it just because of the balance of it. Well, I agree with Pat on all the maneuverability of it, but the other thing is you're getting some more mass back there uh, for that heat saturation that we're talking about with the pencil. 
So it does a little bit better with the heat saturation. And then uh, guys who are doing uh, dissipator type builds or whatever, the gas block journal is actually 1.9 inches and it'll fit an A2 on there for guys that want to do that. Let's, uh, we have a couple more quick things that I want to hit just because, uh, you know, they aren't necessarily profiles, but they definitely go into the barrel shopping uh, and AR build equation. And that is talking about fluting. And, uh, you know, especially for your larger, you know, your larger size loads, just you, these things are starting to get heavy, uh, longer lengths, larger rounds. All of these things are starting to really put a lot of weight on there. Um, and so that's where fluting comes into the picture, where you're trying to reduce um, some overall mass, but you also need to keep that rigidity. You need to be able to have good heat dissipation. And we do what you see uh, on top here is an example of our heavy fluting and then our patented uh, flame fluting. Um, Mark, do you want to give just kind of the, you know, 100 foot view of, of what fluting is all about and maybe some of the features that people see on some of our barrels? Yeah, the uh, fluted barrels are going to be for the guys who like punching paper or hunting. Um, my favorite barrels are heavy fluted. So the flutes add rigidity. They add uh, surface area for cooling. Um, and I don't know, they're just, they're, they're, one of my favorite profiles personally. So the other thing that, you know, we could talk about with fluting is just the sheer fact that this weight reduction happens all the way up and down the barrel. So, you know, we're talking about weight being removed all over the place and not just, you know, after a gas journal uh, or just at one end of the barrel. Um, Pat, you want to speak to that and maybe how it affects, you know, overall weight and, and just balance of the barrel itself? Yeah, the reason people love fluted barrels so much is it gives you a, a kind of a best of both worlds, just like our gunner profile is a great balance of the SOCOM and the pencil. Fluted barrels offer you the diameter of a heavier profile barrel, to, barrel and with that greater diameter comes better rigidity, you know, better handling of heat see typically um but it also has the benefit of being a little bit closer to a medium weight barrel because when you do those flutes in the machine you're removing material so when you're pulling that material out you're pulling steel off of the barrel and that means you're reducing the weight so it, it it's a way to balance the, the the good parts of both a heavier profile barrel and a midweight barrel. So our barrels fall into two categories, our duty series and our match series. This is a, a page lifted out of our product catalog for the year. Um, the one thing to remember is all of the kind of hardcore stuff about how we manufacture barrels, you know, the, uh, the mag particle inspection, all the heat treating, all of that kind of stuff, salt bath nitriding, all of that stuff is the same, um, duty series and match series where you start to come into a little bit of difference is going to be with uh, the type of rifling we're using in each and obviously the nickel Teflon extension and so on. Um, Mark or Pat, do you, which of you would like to talk about maybe the differences between our duty series and the match series first? Well, the, uh, the, the, there, there's a couple key differences between the, the two categories and, and, um, for some of our barrel profiles, we offer them in both variations. So we kind of let the consumer pick, you know, what, what role you're trying to fill and what fits your needs best. Um, the main differences between duty series and mass series are going to be the material. The duty series is 4150 chrome moly vanadium. The match series is 416R stainless. So with the match series, we're giving a little bit uh, or we're taking a step forward towards imp um, giving you a better chance of shooting more accurately. Um, we always like to phrase it that way because it still comes down to the shooter. Um, so, but we're going to give you a couple technical advantages with the match series. So 416 R stainless, when you button rifle, it takes the form of the button slightly better than 4150. So it has the potential to be more accurate um, because it, it, mimics the, the bore mimics the shape of the button a little bit better another big difference in the match series is going to be 5r rifling 
um, you know, so we've got a great blog post that walks through all of the, the benefits of five R rifling, and that's available on all of the match series barrels, uh, all of the match series rifle barrels. And then for the rifle barrel line, the other big difference is going to be the nickel Teflon coated extension. So when you're looking at this image or you're looking at product images, the easiest way to pick a match series barrel out is that it's got a silver extension on there rather than a nitrided black extension. The nickel Teflon has a little bit better lubricity, so it's going to be easier to clean and it's going to help with feeding a little bit better. Um, it's just, you know, an added little benefit, a nice touch for functionality and to get you a little bit more of a premium product. Um, the final difference is going to be the crowns of the barrel. So the crown is, you know, at the end, that's the last, it's where when your bullet comes out of the barrel, your gases hit your crown. If you have a bad crown on your barrel, it's going to completely ruin your accuracy. Um, and you'll, you'll shoot a bunch of ammo trying to figure out what the problem is. And it's, it's a crown issue. So, we do an 11 degree target crown on our duty series of barrels. And then the match to match series of barrels is a recessed 11 degree target crown. It's also called a Cooper target crown where you basically step that crown back down a little bit. So you give it a little bit more protection, um, especially when you're talking about more accuracy oriented barrels. A lot of shooters will not put muzzle brakes or muzzle devices on there. So they may be going to the range with just a bare crown and it gives it that added layer of protection that, you know, if you bang into something or you hit it on a concrete bench or, you know, something like that, that you're not going to completely trash the accuracy of your rifle. We'll be right back with more of the Facts and Blogging podcast right after this. I am up with Facts and Blogging podcast. Secure peace of mind with lockdown state-of-the-art technology. From security cameras to vaults and much more, they help you keep your home and valuables safe. Lockdown products monitors and provides constant connectivity for your high-value, high-consequence items. Learn more at Lockdown.com. It's not secure unless it's on lockdown. So, Jay, I was thinking maybe we could just break down between uh, kind of the major lines, our duty series and our match series and the different steel that is used in those and why we have chosen the things that we have chosen. Yeah, absolutely. So um, our duty series uses all uh, 4150 chromoly vanadium uh, steel to... Uh, Oh, over here. Ooh. Ooh. It's Ooh. getting personal. All right, now I go. <laughs> uh, 4150 chromoly vanadium steel uh, yeah. to the mill B standard. Uh, and our match series uses a uh, 416R stainless. Okay, so what are some of the properties of 4150? And this is a sample of uh, one of our integral barrels that uses 4150, correct? Right. Right. So I, I think the differences between them are slight, but um, you would think that um, 4150 is generally a, a better steel in applications that um, require higher heat or more extended heat. Um, you know, both both barrel materials have, have good um, solid wear characteristics. Um, you know, but 4150 would would mainly be used when when you're expecting uh, more prolonged heat or higher heat. Uh, and 416R um, machines slightly better. Uh, it's actually a extremely uh, machinable stainless, uh, so you can get preciser cuts in it. Um, so so all the the internal features um, are are more precisely machinable, um, you know, which, which leads to better accuracy. Gotcha. And so we have, you know, two different samples standing up here. One is, uh, made technically in the duty series in our integral barrels, uh, as it uses the 4150 and then one of our match series barrels. Uh, this happens to be one of the, the flame fluted profiles, which is going to be using that 416R. So I think that, uh, you would you would be looking at three different possible steels uh, in in stainless choices for for uh, gun barrels in general. Uh, 416, 416R, and 410. Um, you know the the difference between 410 and the 416 um, has to do with uh, low temperature uh, performance. So uh, we use 416R, which which is uh, 
much better than 410 in extremely cold situations, um, you know, down to about negative 40. Um, 410 can be uh, prone to, to cracking and failure in that range. Okay. Um, so uh, the difference between 416 and 416 R, uh, I think the R blend actually was um, a Crucible Steel's uh, proprietary blend at some point. Um, but the uh, the differences have to do with uh, lower sulfur content in the 416 R and the uh, introduction of uh, molybdenum. 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 You know, which adds some corrosion resistance to the steel. Uh, you also have that in the, the 4150, you know, so the 4150 chromoly vanadium. Uh, yes. You know, the molybdenum. Yes. You know, is adding some, some corrosion resistance to that. So. Okay. And regardless, I mean, we still do the salt bath nitride on, on both uh, barrel yeah. series and, and pretty much everything that we make. It seems like there's, you know, as far as barrels and bulk carrier groups and, and things like that are concerned. Yeah, um, absolutely. What is, you know, for those who don't know, um, what, what attributes does salt bath nitriding have? And then maybe what are some, uh, what are some other treatments that, you know, people might find elsewhere on the market that isn't salt bath nitride? So salt bath nitride, um, adds a lot of surface hardness. Um, you know, it, it's not a coating. Um, it, it actually, um, uh, impregnates the metal sort of, I guess you could say, um, yeah. as a diffusion layer, uh, you know, in, into the metal that, uh, is, you know, about, about 12 thou deep, you know, it, it, it's sort of the, the hardness and the properties taper off throughout that, that, um, 12 thousandths of an inch, Got um, it. you know, but, but it has a lot of, uh, surface hardness, um, wear and abrasion resistance, uh, lubricity. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good, good coating that the properties are attractive the material properties yep. are attractive so you know then then some other um you know treatments of barrels you might see would be uh like a mag foss which uh is, is primarily for um corrosion resistance um you would generally see mag foss paired with like a chrome lined uh, i mean i guess not generally you would often see mag foss uh paired with chrome lined although there are some uh discount barrels that okay. just get mag fossed um, okay also some discount barrels that just get black oxided which you know does nothing really it's yeah. it's just uh and especially when you're considering life of the barrel and corrosion resistance and things like that. Right. And with the salt bath nitride, like that's throughout the barrel. That's just not, not just on the surface, right? Yeah. It's actually in the bore as well. Yeah, right, right. They dip it in a uh, molten salt bath that Ooh, you know, gets all the way through there. <laughs> you gotta yeah, love it when it's right. molten. Yeah. Um, something else that's on the match series barrels, at least, you know, rifle and, you know, PCC style barrels and so on, is going to be the uh, the extension. People will notice the difference between the extension on something in the duty series and uh, something in the match series. And even though it might be covered up on some of the coated barrels like the 10 PVD and the chameleon. We still have this nickel Teflon extension. What, what the, how is that an upgrade for, for uh, the barrel buyer? That is a, uh, extremely slick surface, yeah, yeah. real high lubricity. Um, you know, good, good, uh, solid wear characteristics. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a hard coating. Uh, so, you know, it doesn't just rub off. Um, you know, but, but mainly has to do with lubricity. You know, what's the, you know, kind of the, the process with, with pistol barrels over, you know, over a rifle or a carbine barrel or what have you. I mean, obviously it's not like, you know, there's no like nickel Teflon extension on a, you know, on a pistol barrel or, or what have you, yeah. but over and above all, is it, is it pretty much the same salt bath nitriding? Um, yeah, same sort uh, of properties. I mean, the the only real difference in the process um, is that we heat treat our uh, pistol barrels post machining. So um, you know, we we don't heat treat rifle barrels uh, post machining. 
Um, you know, we, we stress relieve all our barrels, uh, pistol and rifle, but our pistol barrels go through a separate heat treating process post machining. And what does that, what does that do for the barrel after doing it after the, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it has to do with, with locking lugs. Um, you know, the pistol barrels have, have more, you know, internal geometry that, that has to interact with slide and frame, uh, you know, so, so this is, uh, adding a little extra hardness in there. So. Yeah. And also, like you were saying, you know, lubricity and you're thinking of moving parts and with that salt bath nitriding and everything, you know, you think of a, a pistol slide racking and, you know, running across the top of the barrel. You know, that's yeah. something that I've noticed, you know, now that that I personally own a, a, an FX-19 is that the barrel wear on the top of the, you know, on the top of the chamber yeah. looks crazy different than the barrel wear on the top of a chamber like from like one of my not to be named uh handguns you know yeah. what i mean like it, it's just like this stock barrel that comes with x handgun uh you know it it's already easy to tell the the difference of the type of wear that it's getting now jay we talked about uh some of the coatings that a lot of people see is just aesthetic and that's okay uh, on the bolt carrier group episode last week but we also on um, especially pistol barrels but on also limited runs of of rifle barrels um, you know we'll do either you know like this chameleon or the golden hued uh, 10 pvd um, but for those folks who maybe didn't catch uh, the um, bolt carrier group episode you know what is you know, 10 PVD, like what does it do besides make things look pretty? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So, um, it's titanium nitride. It's a, uh, PVD process, um, which is physical vapor deposition. Um, it's a tool coating. Um, you know, that's, that's where it was born. Um, it offers really high hardness, um, you know, some amount of lubricity, uh, you know, but, but really has to do with hardness. Um, uh, you know, our, our pistol barrels all, um, regardless of, of, you know, whether they're tin coated or chameleon or whatnot, um, are all salt bath nitride at first. Uh, PVD is, is a line of sight process. So it's, it's only getting, um, external features. It's not going through the bore. So the bore, uh, remains salt bath nitride. uh, the exterior gets um, bead blasted off. They they bead blast off what um, what the nitriders call the white layer, which is actually the black layer. Okay. Uh, so they <laughs> they bead blast that off the um, the exterior, and then they uh, they PVD the exterior. So you know you're getting you're getting high hardness um, on all these these geometric features back here. The the locking lugs, uh, the hood. Uh, feed ramps. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, some folks will look at it and just be like, eh, it's cosmetic, but you know, yes, it does add some cosmetic pop, but yeah. there's definitely something, you know, there's, there's more that's happening than, than just what, uh, than just what meets, meets the eye for sure. Yeah. And then same thing when we're talking about the chameleon coating, is that still a, you know, a, 10 PVD process or what, what, what is that process? Yeah. So, uh, right. When we talked about last week, um, the tin, uh, the chameleon coating actually starts as, as a tin coating and then is a, uh, intentional machine malfunction. Uh, so they, they do something to, you know, malfunction out the machine and the cycle early and, uh, that deposition, um, leads to really unpredictable uh color and finish uh yeah. results so yeah and so we and again we mentioned this on the uh, bulk area group episode but no two of these look alike um you know they some of them might be similar if they're in if they were in the same batch but like we spoke about depending on where it is in the machine and yeah, i mean yeah. you know from barrel to barrel even you know thread protector to thread protector you know it could look you know different so that's why you know sometimes we get a batch that maybe more blue or maybe more purple or maybe more green or as you flip them around you know, yeah. especially on the rifle barrels, since it's so much uh, surface area and we'll, we'll show a clip yeah. of that as you spin it, you know, you'll notice like, Hey, like this side was, you know, more green or more blue. So it's kind of, we do get questions sometimes on like, 
you know, hey, could you do this like specific grade? And it's like, well, <laughs> not right. really. I mean, it's it's really <laughs> left up to the, the forces right. of nature, you know, how it comes out. So it does definitely have like a, uh, a, a really neat, uh, you know, DNA to it for sure. We'll be right back with more of the Facts and Blogging podcast right after this. I am up with the Facts and Blogging. Tipton Gun Cleaning has everything you need to keep your gun clean and operating properly. They know that a clean gun is a safe gun. With everything from vices to cleaning tools, they have the products you need to take your gun maintenance to the next level. Learn more at TiptonClean.com. It's not clean until it's Tipton Clean. But the other thing that we teased at SHOT Show uh, are the, what I have you talking about today are pin gas block barrels. So for those who don't know kind of why someone would pin a gas block to their barrel before we get into our product, would you just talk a little bit about why someone would want to pin a gas block rather than just using the set screws or another method? Um, I, I think the, the leading reason is, uh, durability and peace of mind. Um, there's, you know, there's a few different methods for attaching gas blocks. There's clamp on style, there's set screws, there's two, even two piece ones out there. Um, and what you see most commonly is set screws. Um, but there, there are a lot of people who, especially if your barrel isn't dimpled, they're, they're, they don't fully trust the set screws. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the pin, the cross pin adds an extra level of security. You know, if you're you're shooting high round count or um, you know a, a high schedule of fire, there's a possibility that you know maybe you forgot to put Loctite on your on your set screws on your gas block, and you have set screws start work, walking their way out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, screws can do that absolutely. So you know the possibility of a screw backing out, and all of a sudden your gas block uh, shifts and and isn't over the gas port properly, and all of a sudden your gun's dead. You know, your right. gun stops working. So um, it's definitely, it's really number one primary purpose is, you know, that added level of security um, of having both the set screws and a cross pin so that your, your gas block cannot shift. And so what's the traditional way of going about that? So say somebody wanted to pin their gas block. Um, obviously, barrels don't necessarily you know, until we talk about ours, you know, if somebody just buys kind of a stock barrel and a stock gas block, I mean, they, they unless they have the tools for it at home to be able to do the cross pin groove, uh, the notching, I mean, they got to send it out to a local shop or a gunsmith or something of that variety. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's previously been the way you could do it. Um, there's been barrel companies that have offered it as kind of a service. Um, for us, it really wasn't a great fit to do a kind of after the fact service um, because it really disrupts the flow of parts and adds a lot of time and, and, and time equals cost. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for us being in a production environment and trying to keep parts moving smoothly, it didn't make a lot of sense to do as a service. So, you know, if someone really wanted one of our barrels, they'd have to buy it buy a gas block and send it to a gunsmith and and the the tricky part of gunsmith is there's a lot of really talented really skilled um well-respected gunsmiths and then there's also guys who just are a gunsmith because they had some business cards made yeah. um, <laughs> and they may not know what they're doing um mm -hmm. you're talking about drilling into the surface of a barrel you have to be very careful not to go too deep, especially when you're looking at lightweight barrels. You can make that sidewall very thin. You could screw up harmonics. So now, you know, your groups are all over the place. Um, so there's, there's a lot of factors and it was not always something someone could acquire easily, um, you know, especially if they didn't have somebody that they knew and trusted to basically drill into their barrel. Yeah. And, you know, when I was getting ready for like getting the product pages and everything together for our barrels, which I'll pull out here in just a moment, I looked at some forums, just some different shooting forums to just kind of to see what other people are talking about when they're asking questions about uh, pinning gas blocks. And a lot of people were talking about, you know, uh, just 
the additional cost. They, everybody was like, okay, well, well, how much does it cost? Like how much does a gunsmith you know, charge to do a service like that and all that sort of stuff? And I mean, it ranged everywhere from like 25 to like 125. I mean, it was kind of all over the place on how much it would cost because like you said, you have a, a kind of a grab bag of experience levels and professionalism levels. And, you know, is this a legitimate shop or some dude in his basement who's like, yeah, I got a vice and a drill. I think I could, I think I could handle that. But this is uh, one of ours and I'll throw up some uh, prettier images since this will be a little hard to see on the webcam. Um, but this is one of our pinned gas block barrels. Now this is one of our gunner profiles. So if you are uh, familiar with our proprietary gunner profile that kind of mixes the best of both worlds from the pencil and the SOCOM. But this is basically how it ships. It ships with the barrel, the gas block uh, with the set screws hand tightened on um, as well as the cross pin. But what you'll notice, and we'll show you uh, a larger image of this, is the fact that the notch is already there. So you can see that um, you know it's done well, it's not chewed up, it's not biting into your finish. Obviously, we know that it isn't too far uh, you know, into the sidewall that it would cause any sort of uh, malfunction or issue. Um, but you know, Pat, how does this, how do we do this? And as far as like machining is concerned, like where does this happen in our process? Uh, kind of how, how do we get there? So that happens right after the gas port is drilled and the barrel, um, the receiver extension pin is drilled and pressed in. So the gas port and extension pin, which is the little silver or black pin that slides into that notch of your upper receiver, um, those two things are done at the same time because they need to be perfectly in line with each other um, so that you're not having where your barrel is your gas port slightly off center and now your gas block has to sit off center and it, it causes all kinds of issues. So those two operations are done at the same time. And then right after that, we notch the barrels in, in production in one of our mills. Um, we've got dedicated fixtures built for it. So that indexes off of that pin location and the gas port location so that you know that notch is in the proper location to line up with the pre-drilled holes that are in the gas block. Yeah. So this is like coming at it as it's coming together, you know, and then it hits our QC again before it's mm -hmm. done anyway, yeah. you know, so it's, it's not like, uh, you know, taking, and I, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to poo-poo talented gunsmiths who do this all the time and there's no problem. But for people who are just getting into it or who might be a little nervous about it, I mean, this, this thing is going to go through our normal QC even after that notch is done. Uh, you know, and it's done in one of our mills, like you said, with dedicated fixtures. It's not being thrown in a vice and drilled with a hand drill or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And if and if you um, if someone decides to do it at home and feels like they have the the right tools to do it, if that notch is not drilled in the correct location, your gas block's not going to sit centered. It's going to be off slightly, and that can cause functioning issues. And if it if it's off at such an angle that when you have the gas block pinned, that the gun won't cycle because the gas port's not aligning with the um, gas port in the gas block. Um, if, if that's not working, then basically scrap that barrel or you have to accept that you're not going to be able to use a pin gas block. Yeah. So, you know, if you get to that point and, and someone's trying to do it on their own and, and they're really dead set on, I want this gas block pinned to this barrel. If it's not done properly, that, that barrel's trashed. Um, yeah. You know, like you said, it still go. All of these go through our normal QC processes. So, in the unlikely occasion where we mess something up, that's still covered by our guarantee. You know, we're going to hundred absolutely replace it. Um, no matter no matter what. So you have that assurance where you don't have that if you're having someone else do it or you're trying to do it yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd imagine not even just for us, but for a lot of barrel manufacturers. I mean, the minute you decide you are going to physically alter the state of the mm -hmm. barrel, I mean, you're in warranty and guaranteed gray zone in general. We'll be right back with more of the Facts and Blog and Podcast right after this. I am welcome to Facts and Blog and Podcast. 
Wheeler Tools makes high quality gunsmithing tools for your bench. With everything from scope mounting to sight adjustment, they have you covered. No matter what the project, Wheeler Tools is engineered to fit the job. Learn more at wheelertools.com. And Jay, right next to you is one of our integral barrels. Yeah. And so we launched these fourth quarter of 2019. I, I believe before I was here, we announced that we were going to be making them, right? Yeah. At like SHOT Show 2019 or something. I think it was NRA Show 2019. Okay. So the thing about the integral barrels that we've been noticing is, number one, as soon as they went on our website for retail sale, I mean, in the first weekend, like we, we released them like a Friday afternoon. And before the weekend was over, like three SKUs were sold out. We have them available for 5.56 five, and uh, nine millimeter PCC, but there's been kind of like a conversation of a lot of people going, oh my God, I've needed this. This is so great. And then there's still a lot of people like just asking why, you know, why do they exist? What is the, you know, what is kind of the perks or maybe the downfalls? What could you do with them? Uh, so, Jay, if you wouldn't mind getting into real quick, what I think is probably the the biggest piece is the how it helps people get to their minimum barrel length requirement, um, you know, before the before the muzzle device. Yeah, so uh, you know the the target market on these is people who are looking for uh, the shortest uh, barreled rifle they can legally build, and you know this is a solution for that. You know, this is a fourteen and a half inch of rifled barrel with an additional inch and a half of muzzle device on the end. Yeah. You know, taking them to that 16 inch legal limit. The other piece that I think has been great about the integral line is it's found its way with the lightweight folks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, for the five, five, six, and I'll hold, hold this up here. This is the gunner profile, I believe of the five, five, six, Yeah, but uh, with a three port break. But, you know, our pencil barrels have always been known as being some of the lightest and yet still most stable things on the market. But the lightweight crowd, like the fact that they don't have to do a threaded muzzle device and the fact that they don't have to do a pin and weld, uh, it's shaved. Like when you're counting down to individual grams, yeah, it makes a difference. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So there, it has been found, uh, found for that. And then we made the decision to put the integral pencil on our ion ultralight. Yeah. Yeah. We had been using a pin and weld barrel, but we replaced it with these. You know, the, the integral line is uh, replacing our entire pin and weld line. Yeah. And I mean, with the integral line, like some, <laughs> so when we first launched it, I remember some people were like, well, will the gas block fit over it? And wouldn't that be silly <laughs> if we released a line of barrels with integral muzzle devices and the gas blocks didn't fit? That'd be silly. Yeah. We promise the gas blocks fit. Um, so that's number one. And number two, we we have been asked, are we going to do other calibers? Are we going to do other profiles and things? And and Jay, something I hear you say a lot when we talk about product is, you know, we we gauge market demand. Yeah, it's, it's all about market and customer demand. You know, I mean, we're open to... Uh, all sorts of expansions of product line or, or new product line, but um, there has to be a demand for it. You know, yeah. we have to have customers writing in about it. We have to hear that the market as a whole can support it. So, yeah, for sure. So the last question about integral barrels that we get a lot uh, and sometimes on a, on a Facebook or Instagram comment, it'll just say, uh, it'll just say suppressor question mark. Um What's yeah? No, no, I mean it's it's a muzzle device integral to the barrel without threads. Uh, this is not, you know, a, a piece for uh, a crowd that wants to run suppressor. You know, we have we have a lot of options that are. We have yeah. a lot of different skews, uh, different barrel lengths, caliber options that will be great on your suppressed build. This isn't it. You know, nice feature about it is. You know, because it's integral, this this doesn't, uh, you know, get into any of the, you know, the ambiguous statements on the ATF about, you know, how to how to pin and weld. Yeah. You know, the, the ATF covers uh, a lot of methods on how to permanently attach a muzzle device, you know, but they don't lay out any rules on how to test that, how to verify that. And, you know, the fact that this is integral to the barrel itself... Um, 
you know, really eliminates all of that ambiguity. You know, there is no testing if your if your weld is good enough. You know, yeah. is there a pin in there? Did the silver solder take? You know, there's, you know, the the ATF lays out some some ways you might attach them, mm-hmm. but is uh, <laughs> really not <laughs> forthcoming in you know how you can verify that. And so, um, you know, one of the nice things about that is is it just eliminates all of that. So I guess that's really kind of the the three things that really helps alleviate some tension for somebody who's interested in a in one of our integral barrels because we've now brought up uh, minimum barrel length. Yeah, we've brought up uh, lightweight for the folks who dig lightweight and want to shave grams, and also like you were saying the the ambiguity of the rules of the pin and weld you know on a government level. Yeah. Right. And so also too, I mean, I'm sure you could find as many fail va- videos on YouTube as you want of muzzle devices blowing off and all that kind of junk. That's not going to happen here on the engineering side. Like, how does this come in? How does this start? I mean, this starts as just like raw steel yeah, stock, like we always just, get, right? It's all just bar steel stock. Yeah. And so, and again, this, there's no seam you know, there's nothing that you could see here that would, you know, make anybody question whether or not it's integral. I mean, it is obviously as you look through the profile, that is all, all just one piece. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's going to be no, uh, uncomfortable taking it out the range and, you know, hoping that, you know, anybody who sees it understands that that's a weld spot on the bottom of it, you know, yeah. and this is permanently attached and no, I don't have, you know, an illegal short barreled rifle, you know, this is, this is integral to it. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's a fear I've always had at, at ranges, you know, with, with a short barreled rifle. Uh, I mean, with a, you know, pin and weld barreled rifle is, yeah. you know, Hey, this is permanently attached. You know, yeah. if I did, you know, grind over the weld spot and, you know, put some re black on it, you know, just to make it look nice. Right. Or you know, it's sort yeah. of an uncomfortable feeling, you know, wanting to make sure that, you know, nobody thinks that you have an illegal short barreled rifle. We'll be right back with more of the Facts and Blogging podcast right after this. Hi, and welcome to the Facts and Blogging podcast. Caldwell provides shooting supplies that are engineered to eliminate the variables that make you miss. With everything from targets, range gear, safety gear, and an impressive line of hearing protection, Caldwell has everything you need for the range besides your firearm. Learn more at caldwellshooting.com. Take your shot to the next level with Caldwell is how do you test uh, your barrels? And there's, there's several different processes that it goes through, obviously, uh, for, for testing. But uh, if you were to just take the 1,000-foot view, Jay, what, what is the kind of the, the testing procedure and quality procedure for uh, barrels? Okay, so, uh, yeah, the, the quality procedure. Um, so our barrels are machined in, in you know, on a number of different steps or, or ops, as we call them. And um, at every op, there are individual quality checks. You know, every time any machining operation is done on, on any part, barrels included, uh, you know, there's a, a first article part that's made, which is the, the first piece that's made, goes to QC and, and they check for, you know, various things that were supposed to be accomplished during that machining process. Um, you know, and they check uh, at various points during uh, production and the last piece and just make sure that, you know, the first piece produced is the same as the 10th, is the same as the hundredth is, you know, the same as the last. Uh, so, you know, at, at every stage of production, um, the parts are reviewed multiple times, uh, you know, so, so I think that's, that's sort of important to know. But um, in terms of the, the big uh, QC checks on barrels, um, we air gauge the bores of every barrel uh, after rifling. So that determines um, bore diameter and uh, concentricity. Um, we hold concentricity to a two tenths uh, tolerance. Um, that's two tenths of a thousandth of an inch, not two, two tenths, tenths of an inch. inch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, two, two, two tenths, tenths of a thousand. thousand of an inch. Zero, 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 two, right? Right. right. Um, you know, so that's a pretty important check, and um, you know, it's it's um, 
it's pretty critical for the accuracy of a barrel that that the the bore be held that close. Right. So you know we ch- we check all that with air gauging. Um, let's see, all of our barrels run through a magnetic particle inspection after profiling. Um, so that is checking for um, seams or cracks or defects in the material. Um, it's a pretty interesting process. Um, yeah. You know, maybe maybe we can film some at some point. Yeah, uh, that'll be something I, I'd love to do because we actually do that here. Yeah, we do that here. Yeah. Um, we have we have a full setup here, and um, the mag particle inspectors have to go through some ridiculous number of hours of training. Um, yeah. They sit in a, a room, uh, a dark room all day with a uh, <laughs> black light on, um, pouring uh, this glow-in-the-dark uh, slurry on barrels. Um, yeah. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So uh, we do that for every barrel. Then um, <clears throat> at the end during barrel assembly, um, we uh, torque the extension on and check headspace on every barrel with... Um, precision ground gauges, uh, you know, for each each caliber. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you've ever seen on the barrel extension, we have um, two paint marks. Uh, those are to show that the barrel uh, extension was torqued on to the proper torque, and then the, the headspace was checked on that barrel. And each operator at that position has different color pens, um, paint pens. And so, you know, you, sometimes you'll see like, yellow and green or, you know, pink and white or, you know, whatever the colors are. Uh, that's so that we can trace back uh, to the actual to operator. The actual operator. Gotcha. So. Gotcha. Yeah, the mag particle thing I think is interesting because, uh, and I, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but it's not necessarily super common that a manufacturer has their own mag particle inspection in their they facility. Usually, they usually shop it out. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they usually send out parts for mag particle inspection if they're if they're inspecting at all. So our first one is uh, actually from right here in Ohio. Mike from North Canton asked, do you really make your barrels from scratch? Patrick. We do. You go out onto our floor any given day, there's a semi in there unloading bundles of steel. Right. Um, you know, we have, we have chrome molly vanadium and, and stainless steel coming in every week, every other week. Um, we've got big cranes that run through the building that have to pick up the bundles, and and then it gets turned into a barrel from there. Right. So that's not something um, every company in the industry can say. Pretty much everything from the you know rifling, profiling, mag particle, heat treating, like it all happens. Like yep. the yeah. most critical aspect of a barrel is the bore the quality of the bore and that's what and we make that in house. Thanks for tuning in this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. As always, we would love for you to like and subscribe on your favorite platforms. Of course, you can find the video version on YouTube, Facebook, Watch, and Vimeo, um, but we are also on your favorite audio podcasting platforms as well. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and a whole bunch more. You could find a graphic that'll get you to all of those platforms at factsandfirearms.com slash blog and click on any one of our recent episodes to find that information, or you can just search Search facts and blog and podcast on your favorite platform or on your voice enabled smart device. Also, we would love to hear from you. If you have some feedback for the show, you have a question you want to hear answered on air, feel free to email us at podcast at factsandfirearms.com. Don't forget to enter into this week's giveaway again from our friends at Crimson Trace and Lockdown. We're giving away a CWL 300 tactical flashlight as well as the Lockdown Puck smart security device. So make sure you go to factsandfirearms.com slash blog and click on episode 49 each day for all of your ways to enter. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. We want to extend our deepest gratitude to military, police, first responders, and more by saying thank you with special pricing and discounts on all facts and products. Here's how you get started. First, you'll head on over to our website, factsandfirearms.com. From there, you'll want to click Support and Guardian Purchase Program in the drop-down. Then you'll see the instructions on how to get started. So let's just walk through those. 
First, you'll want to register for an account on our website. If you've already bought something from us on our website before, then this part's already taken care of. Second, you'll want to send a copy of your credentials or some reasonable verification of affiliation to customer service at factionfirearms.com. We get a lot of emails where people are like, hey, will this count? Will this ID count? Will this VA card count? Chances are, yes, a lot of them will count, but make sure you attach an image or a copy of that verification to the email before you even ask customer service. That way they can expedite the process for you. As soon as the account has been created or updated, we will send you an email letting you know that you're ready to go. The discount will be available anytime online when you go to your shopping cart. If you have any more questions, please email customer service at faxandfirearms.com.